And now for something completely different. We're going to start off with Dr. Rob Simard, the creator of Pocus Cases, the video series on the EM Cases website, who gave one of the best talks I've heard at the EM Cases course, June 2019. As you'll hear in a moment, he goes beyond ACLS by telling the story that turned him onto the power of POCUS for ACLS and then gives you his approach to PEA arrest. Now, because this is a controversial topic, I invited none other than Scott Weingart to then discuss his approach to PEA arrest. And as you'll see, there's quite a bit of overlap, but a few nuanced differences. By the end of this podcast, I hope that you'll settle on your own way to manage PEA by taking the best parts of these approaches and integrating them into your local practice. Take it away, Rob. My name's Rob Samard. I'm one of the emergency physicians here at North York General, as well as at Sunnybrook Hospital. And I'm going to give you a talk on going beyond what ACLS teaches you, beyond the algorithm. And a little bit of a disclaimer, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is controversial today. I can tell you that what I'm going to talk to you about, where we go beyond ACLS, it's not evidence-based. We're starting to build some evidence for what I'm going to talk about, but it's not going to be in the next guidelines yet. We still have a lot of work to do regarding the evidence for it. So a lot of people say, you know, like, hey, I've been a clinician for 20 years. I see that you guys are using point of care ultrasound. I don't feel it makes me any faster. In fact, when I take over for other patients, I see there's a million people in the department. It's because they use ultrasound. It slows them down. And I've never needed it for the last 20 years to help my patient care. I don't know why you guys use it. So people say, why do I use POCUS? Like I say that I'm a good clinician. Why do I need POCUS to help me out? So let me tell you why. I'll bring it back to a case that really kind of opened my eyes a bit as to limitations that we have as as clinicians. So Mars is now going to tell you the story of how he was convinced of the power of POCUS in ACLS. And he'll ask the following question. When we give adenosine, you know, that terrible drug that makes people feel like they're on the verge of death, is there cardiac standstill during the electrical pause that we see on the monitor after we've pushed, say, 6 or 12 milligrams? Adenosine. So the long pause. What's happening during that pause? Does that, what do you think the heart's physically doing? If you were to look at the heart, if you had that, that vision to look inside someone's body and can look at the heart, what do you think is actually happening during that pause? Yeah, you'd think that it's standstill, right? So I asked a cardiologist because I was pa- I was giving the medication and I said to a cardiologist, does the heart actually stop during that pause? What do you think the cardiologist said? So that cardiologist says, of course not. Like the heart couldn't stop for that long of a period of time because if it did, the patient would pass out. And I'm like, but they feel pretty unwell. So clearly like something's happened. They go, no, it doesn't stop. Adenosine doesn't cause standstill of the heart. And then all of a sudden the patient says, oh, I'm starting to feel something. I'm starting to feel something. And then... Pow! Stops, and we have a systole on the monitor for about mm, three seconds, and now the heart's going to start to take over and beat again. So I said, it does stop the heart. So let's keep that in mind while we talk about this next case, because this next case is very controversial. An 80-year-old male is stuck in the corner of your emergency department, waiting for medicine overnight, It's been waiting eight hours for the medicine staff to come and to be admitted to the hospital. At nursing handover, the patient's found unresponsive, and you're called stat to see the patient. So Mark's going to tell you a bit about how dismal we are at palpating a pulse with our fingers, and then explain the difference between true PEA and pseudo-PEA. So we only accurately determine a pulse 54% of the time in healthcare providers, in regular healthy patients that they did in the um, in the OR. So we are not good at all at feeling for pulses. It's really a coin toss. And I can imagine that in cases where there's profound shock or cardiac arrest, that we're even worse at feeling it. So if you've ever been there in a cardiac arrest case where someone says, I don't feel a pulse, and someone says, oh, I think I might have felt a pulse, that is the reality of things. It's very difficult to feel a pulse, especially in someone who's profoundly hypotensive or in a patient who may not actually have a pulse. So this brings me to true PEA versus pseudo PEA. Both of these have organized activity on the monitor 
and the inability for us to detect a pulse by the palpation method. So true PEA, it's truly a pulseless state, and there's also no output. That's what true PEA is. Pseudo PEA is when we can't palpate a pulse. However, there is output that we just can't detect. So the patient does have circulation that we are not feeling. So think of pseudo PEA not as a cardiac arrest state, but as a profound shock state. I'm going to repeat that because it's so important. Pseudo PEA should be thought of as a profound shock state rather than a cardiac arrest. And there are studies that say that aortic pressures during human cardiac arrest, that pseudo PEA, we used to call PEA electromechanical dissociation. We've been around medicine long enough, we used to call it EMD. Uh, we now call it PEA. So they did show, even back in 1992, that this phenomenon existed. And also shows in animal studies that doing CPR in pseudo PEA states is actually harmful because it prevents the heart from filling up. So for those people that say, well, if you don't feel a pulse, what's the harm in doing CPR? This is the harm. You're preventing potential filling of the heart and allowing further circulation of the heart. So in determining the difference between a true PA state and a pseudo PA state might actually affect your management and probably something important that we determine. All right. So we suck at manual pulse checks. Even in healthy patients, we're accurate only about half the time. And again, the difference between true PEA and pseudo PEA is that while both have organized activity on the monitor and an inability to detect a pulse by palpation, the true PEA is a truly pulseless state with no significant cardiac output versus pseudo PEA has some cardiac output that we just can't detect with our fingers on the carotid artery. So now that we know the difference between true PEA and pseudo PEA, Let's get into how you can tell the difference between the two at the bedside and why that's so important. So what are some ways to determine if someone's in a pseudo PEA state versus a true PEA state? Any adjuncts that we can use? So we saw POCUS, that's one. Any others? Lift the legs to see if you can start to feel it. And if you do, you still may be in PA, even a pseudo PEA even if you don't feel it. You can use other tools like a Doppler ultrasound to detect flow. Anything else that can detect flows? So... Art lines, end tidal CO2, POCUS can all be things that we readily can use to determine if someone actually has output. So art lines, back in, in 1985, they determined that art lines during cardiac arrest can help us with a few things. They can indicate perfusion through the vessels, as well as can give feedback for the quality of CPR that you're giving. So it can be quite helpful. The only problem is, is that you have to put them in and rarely are we putting them in in cardiac arrest. No one's going to first line put in an art line. If you're an ICU doctor and someone already has an art line, use it as your marker of whether or not you're having output or not. So to help determine whether or not there is perfusion to vital organs, you can use art lines, you can use end tidal CO2, you can use POCUS. And one thing that Samar didn't mention, the oxygen saturation curve, which we'll get to a little bit later. Now, when it comes to arterial lines, Weingart has a very different view as to who should be using arterial lines in cardiac arrest. So I'll let him rant now. We're an academic shop, so we got people. That, that's the nice thing about an academic shop is there's always too many people during my cardiac arrest. And getting an arterial line in the patient's groin is super easy for us. I honestly think it's super easy for any ED doc. Um, this is one skill I could say is fairly universal, is all ED docs know how to put in femoral central lines in the vein. Just slide over a little. And the technique is exactly the same to do a uh, Seldinger femoral A-line. And then, so the only barriers to doing A-lines during cardiac arrest is your single doc shop, in which case, unless you have a nurse-led code, um, that's not a good use of your time. If you do have a nurse-led code, it probably is a good use of your time. You need the capability of, setting it up, which means you have to have the supplies, steal them from your ICU, and then say, we want to stock them too. And you need someone to set them up, um, which could be your nurses if they're willing to do it. Or you might just say to yourself, uh, I'll watch the five-minute video on MCRIT, and I'll figure out how to do it myself, because it's not hard. It's not rocket science. We do things that are much tougher. Um, and then you need the, the actual cable for your monitor, um, which that might actually be the biggest barrier because now you have to get, you know, like a cartridge that'll plug into your monitor. But if you already has it, then there's no reason not to do this. And it changes the entire 
complexion of the cardiac arrest because all of a sudden I don't care about contractions anymore. I don't care about pulse anymore because instantly with each rhythm check, I get an absolute answer to the question of, is this patient generating sufficient contractions to generate a sufficient pulse to generate a sufficient blood pressure to perfuse the heart and brain? And all of my questions are answered instantly without any work at all, all for the cost of a 60 second procedure that all of us should be able to do. So that's two opposing views about arterial lines and distinguishing pseudo-PEA from true PEA. The other ways are with POCUS, the oxygen saturation showing a persistent waveform, and end tidal CO2 showing persistent elevations of 30 or 40. And that's what Samar is going to talk about next. End tidal CO2, non-invasive way. This is quite easy to use. Um, the way that we generally use end tidal CO2 is when the numbers are really low. Like if you're doing CPR and get an end tidal CO2 of 8, you're probably not doing very good CPR or there's going to be a very bad outcome. Um, so if you're getting end tidals of 8, if you push harder and push faster, you'll get a little jump in your end tidal CO2. Generally, with our really good paramedics doing CPR, we're getting numbers 18 to 22 in cardiac arrests. And then if you get a big, big jump from like 18 up to like 40 or 50, that's a sign you got ROSC. So that's a sign that the patient actually has a pulse. So when I get a phone call from my paramedic and they're in the field and they say, Rob, we've been doing CPR for the last 15 minutes. We're wondering about termination. We've given you a call. We've given three epinephrines. And I say, what rhythm they're in? They say, well, it's a narrow complex PEA. And I'll say, what's your entitled CO2? Well, our entitled CO2 is 50. I'll say that patient very well may have a pulse. You just can't detect it. So I'll recommend that patient gets transferred to the hospital. If they give me that same scenario and tell me the end title is 10, then I'm quite certain this person has no output. And after they've ran the algorithm, I'm more, more likely to give them a termination resuscitation order. That's a little bit about using end title CO2 to tell between pseudo PEA and true PEA. There's also the oxygen saturation wave and the art line, which we've talked about a little bit. The next thing is using POCUS. So POCUS can also be used. So Nemo was exactly right. He saw this vigorously contracting heart and decided that this is a patient who is having potentially some output. And this is a patient who's in that pseudo PEA realm. We can now entertain pseudo PEA. And you can go one step further. And this is the part that is kind of the thing that I'm very, very interested in is I see the heart's beating, but if the heart's empty, it's not circulating any blood. Why don't we check out what's going on with the carotid artery? And during our pulse checks, I'm just pushing on that carotid. And as you can see, the carotid artery is beating. Two things are very helpful in that. First, I'll then put my fingers directly over where I see the carotid beating. And some of the times I say, oh, I feel the pulse now. I just wasn't feeling in the right spot. Or B, I still may not feel the pulse, but I can see they have a pulse. If you put color on that, you will see blood flow rolling through the carotid. So this is one way of telling if the patient has outflow into the main vessel. And when I see this, this is pseudo-PEA. I'm very inclined, even though I don't feel a pulse, to stop CPR and treat this as a profound shock state by giving this person high-dose uh, infusions of, of medications like I'll start norepi and run it, and shortly afterwards, I'm sure we're all going to start feeling a pulse because this patient had one all the time. We just couldn't feel it. Let's look at what the opposite looks like. This is true PEA. That heart, I promise you, is plain. You can see the stagnant flow, but there's no physical cardiac activity. And when I go over the carotid artery now, the carotid artery completely collapses and doesn't beat. There is no flow in this patient. This patient's in true PEA. And it's very simple and easy to do. You put it over the carotid, you identify it, and you just push. It takes less than five seconds, and you can tell if there's output or not. So to differentiate pseudo-PEA from true PEA with POCUS, you can look at the heart for contractility, and you can look at the carotid or femoral artery to see a pulse. Now, up until recently, the big argument against using POCUS for pulse checks and cardiac arrests was that some studies showed that it prolongs the pause in chest compressions, which we all know is bad. But some Martin colleagues published the POCUS 
pulse check paper recently, which does show, well, I'll let Samar tell you. So the POCUS pulse check just in March got published. It took a lot of time because a lot of people said that it's so dangerous to stop CPR, even though Andrea, who's here at the course, had a great case where she came to this course. She heard me and Jordan talk about this, and we had a patient who she saw. She checked the carotid. She saw there was flow. She said, stop CPR, ran pressors. The patient survived to hospital discharge, and that's one of our many patients in this case series. And this study here, the POCUS pulse check, looked at how good we are at determining this. Is this something that anyone can do or do you need like super advanced training for? And the conclusion is carotid pulse detection in live subjects was not slower using ultrasound compared to the palpation method and demonstrated higher first attempt success rate and less variability in measurement times. And it took them less than five seconds to determine it in the vast majority of the cases. So it's a very easy thing to do. And it's essentially pushing over the carotid with a little bit of pressure. If you see it pulsate on you, it's real. If you don't see it pulsate, it completely collapses, true PEA. The next time you have the ultrasound machine nearby and you're looking at someone's heart, just check. I know they're, you know they're alive because they're talking to you. Just use the high-frequency probe, put it over the carotid, and you'll see how easy it is to see the carotid pulsating at you. Now, Smart's going to touch on some of the pitfalls of using POCUS in cardiac arrest. Now... As much as I do think POCUS does help in certain scenarios, I see some of my colleagues when they're using ultrasound and there's just a few things that I want to use as kind of like words of caution when you're using point of care ultrasound. Um, Sometimes you can get carried away where you feel the ultrasound tells you everything and that's not true at all. And I see sometimes that my colleagues are ultrasounding a patient for like 40 or 50 seconds and are losing time and what they should be doing. And that's, you know, starting CPR. So this study came out that point-of-care ultrasound and cardiac arrest is actually leading to longer pauses and lengthy delays in CPR. And another study came out that basically said, if using uh, ultrasound and CPR, it's associated with long delays in chest compressions. And they'd be right. I've, I've, I've personally witnessed this like 40-second pauses where I've said, hey, like maybe just start CPR again and we'll sort out the ultrasound later. And not that anyone doesn't know this, but if you're not doing CPR on someone who doesn't have a pulse, you're not getting any... Uh, perfusion going to the brain or to the uh, coronary. So you don't really want to do these long pauses. We know long pauses in CPR have very, very poor outcomes. So what are you going to do to prevent this? How, when you're going to, Rob's saying, hey, ultrasound's helpful in cardiac arrest and he wants us to check the pulse and the heart. How are we going to do this without slowing things down and causing long delays? You don't say, okay, pause CPR. Now let me get the ultrasound machine out. Now let me gel it. Oh, I forgot to turn it on. Hold on a second. I want to do the ultrasound now. What you want to do is you want to be ready to act. So when you know there's 10 seconds left, you've already generated the image of the heart that you wanted while they're doing CPR on the sub view. And the second they stop, shoot a quick video of what you're, of what you're seeing. Do it for more, no more than 10 seconds. And if you're not able to make a decision within the 10 seconds, resume CPR and then go watch your video that you just did to make a decision about what you're seeing. And same thing with the carotids. I have it over the carotid while they're doing CPR for the last 10 seconds. Okay, let's stop CPR. I already have my probe there and I can make a quick decision on what to do. So I would probably say that the carotid's better, but I would say that there's not much you're not losing much by doing the femoral. In fact, the vast majority of the ones I do are femoral because I'm mostly at the foot of the bed. So I'll just take a look. I'm very happy with a compressed femoral. I'm very happy to say that's true PEA. A pulsation through the femoral, I'm even more inclined to say this person's alive. If we're perfusing the feet, we're perfusing the brain. So this is how you minimize interruptions in CPR. You get ready to act before you stop CPR. Let's get a bit more into the logistics of minimizing pauses in chest compressions with POCUS. So in your first pulse check, you put your POCUS probe either on the femoral artery or on the heart. Weingart generally goes to the heart first, while Samard generally goes to the femoral first. So let's start with Samard's take. So he first looks at the femoral pulse with the ultrasound probe, and then he looks at the heart on the subsequent pulse check. If he sees a pulsation on his ultrasound pulse check, he does not resume chest compression since the patient already has cardiac output, and he then will ultrasound all the other areas since no chest compressions are occurring anymore. So in other words, he prioritizes pipes over pump in PEA arrest. Now, there is one caveat of Samard's femoral first approach. It is possible to see vigorous cardiac activity with no ultrasound pulse. 
You can see this with profound hypovolemia, like a massive GI bleed, trauma, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. And you usually know this already from the EMS history. So if he suspects profound hypovolemia from the EMS history, Samard will look at the heart first, and if he sees vigorous cardiac activity, he's more likely to just pour in volume and hold off on the epi. So that's Samard's approach. So what's Weingart's approach? Remember, Weingart generally goes to the heart first. So Weingart says he does do a manual pulse check, even though he knows it's kind of useless, as the patient is being transferred from the EMS stretcher onto the ED stretcher, but he goes straight to the heart view on the first pause in chest compressions on the ED stretcher. So let's hear Weingart's sequence of how he integrates POCUS into the PEA arrest. So Dr. Weingart, when it comes to PEA arrest, I understand that you have basically a four-step or four-component approach to PEA arrest. Given what Dr. Samard has talked about so far, can you just go through for us those four components or four steps, and then we'll break them down one by one and talk about how pragmatically you'll get the job done? Sure. So uh, I, I think about them almost as a chain of survival because, uh, you know, one through four, you you need all of them, um, but you can't get number three without number two. So let's go through them one by one. Number one is you need a rhythm capable of perfusion, which means something that looks like sinus brain or sinus tack or, or normal sinus rate or even VT, though that is a separate algorithm, but you could actually think about that in the PA world, but don't because they've broken that out entirely. So you need some perfusing rhythm. Then two is you actually need that rhythm to generate contraction of the heart. And then three in the chain, you need that contraction of the heart to be sufficient to generate a pulse. And then four, you need that contraction generating a pulse, generating a sufficient blood pressure to perfuse the heart and brain enough that you're not going to degenerate in this new situation you're in back to something worse. Now, four implies one through three, and three implies one and two, and and et cetera. But um, you might check at any point in the chain, given the individual circumstances of that moment in the arrest. And then if you have that, then you have to go higher up the chain and check those other things. So you've got 60-year-old man comes in, collapses at home, cardiac arrest, the paramedics are doing CPR as they arrive. And the first thing you want to know, the first component is, is there a rhythm? And of course, this is important because if there's uh, no perfusible rhythm, you just keep on doing CPR. But this podcast is about PEA. So uh, let's say you do your rhythm check. What are the micro components of that very first rhythm check. Are you doing focus on the groin? Are you doing focus on the heart? End tidal CO2, uh, art line. What, there's so many different options here in terms of what you're going to do in that very first rhythm and pulse check. Yeah. So I do my first rhythm check on EMS's stretcher. So they come in, I say, stop CPR for a second, or I do it myself on their mechanical device if they have one. And I look on their defib. What are they in? Are they in V-fib, V-tac? If they are, get right back on the chest and charge up the defib and then shock on EMS's stretcher. If they're in asystole, well, first of all, I don't care about this code quite as much as I did before I found that out. Um, and, and B, then we just continue CPR. And, and then if they're in PA, that's super important. We'll get back on the chest. We'll transform over to our stretcher. Okay, now I know the patient's in PA. I want to grab my ultrasound machine. We'll give them like a good cycle of CPR to make up for that pause. And then I will throw my ultrasound probe in the subxiphoid area, just as uh, Rob talked about in his excellent lecture, and I'll get a good view of the heart. And then when our nurse tells us, you know, it's going to be 30 seconds to a rhythm check. I'm really going to get ready. And I'm going to have my finger primed over the record button. And as soon as she announces rhythm checks, some, one of my colleagues is looking at the uh, ECG monitor. So I don't even have to look up. And my only job is to get like a four or five second clip of what that heart is doing. And then we get right back on the chest and do CPR. Then I have my time to really evaluate that image, that subside void view of the heart. And I'm looking for really just two things, which is, is there a pericardial effusion that could indicate tamponade is the cause of this patient's PEA? 
And then is there actual cardiac contractions? Now, if there is, then we could go further in a little bit. If there's not, the question I have to ask my colleague is, what was the rate of that PEA? Because if it was super slow, if it was like 20, then I might have missed it. I might have missed the contraction. It means I'm going to have to do a slightly longer pocus of that heart on a subsequent rhythm check. But if the rate was anything reasonable, that four seconds would have caught a contraction. And then I could break this patient into now two categories based on this initial survey by POCUS. Is this patient what we call, and these terms are dumb, I, I, I will preface with that, but they are at least not ambiguous. So is this patient PRES, P-R-E-S, they are pulseless, they have a rhythm, they have an echocardiographic standstill. Those patients generally die. And we're going to still run the arrest and we're still going to do all sorts of stuff. And they may turn into something better, but they have a dismal survival rate. Or are they PREM, which is a patient who's pulseless, they have a rhythm, and they have echocardiographic motion. And by motion, we don't mean that their valve is opening and closing. That is a agonal situation in many cases. Um, but they have real organized contraction of their heart. And that is a markedly more survivable group. So Scott, if you're putting your focus on uh, the sub xiphoid view to begin with, you still don't know if they have a pulse. So how do you sort of integrate the pulse part into that rhythm check, that first break in chest compressions? Yeah. So I, I'll say, and I should have mentioned earlier that if they were on EMS to stretcher and had a potentially perfusing rhythm. We will do a hand pulse check um, at that moment, just real quick at the carotid. Um, I don't put much faith in it. I don't believe in hand pulse checks. They're usually garbage. The POCUS answers the question somewhat better because if they have echocardiographic standstill, they don't have a pulse. And therefore, there is no reason to waste any time on a pulse check at this point. If they have a contraction, it's usually worth not starting CPR again and actually doing a pulse check. And now how to do that is probably the topic we should talk about next, Anton. And it's it's tough because it's going to vary in terms of the arrest. Because I told you just now, uh, just get right back on the chest, do CPR, review your echo at your leisure, um, which is probably good advice. But in general, if you're good at ultrasound, you're seeing the stuff you need to see instantaneously. And if I saw contractions, uh, what I would do as opposed to what I would say is I probably would not start contractions again. Um, and, and actually do my pulse check now. On the other hand, if you're like, oh, I'm not sure what I'm seeing, I want some time to review, the safest thing is get back on the chest, review at your leisure, and then make the determination after you've really reviewed the images. But most of the time, uh, I could see instantly, in real time, there's contractions or they're not. And if there is contractions, then I would do a pulse, pulse check, which is uh, Rob's term. They This group published it, which I'm so thankful for. I was doing this in the groin for a long time, but I had no literature and I had no words. And now we actually have a very good terminology. So the pulse, pocus, pul wow, it is hard to say though. The pocus pulse check is a markedly superior way than hand pulse check. And for me, I go in the groin because the neck is always busy and I will just have uh, my probe over the femoral vein, which is easy to find, and therefore look where the femoral artery is and just see with some uh, slight compression, is it pulsating or not? So we're on the femoral pulse, and now we'll divide that into two. Do we feel a pulse or don't we feel a pulse? So let's start with, do we, we do feel a pulse. So you feel a pulse, you still don't know whether they're in profound shock or whether they're, they've bounced back and have a normal blood pressure or not. Okay, so we're, we're at the point where we see a pulse, because that is the, the new concept here, right, is uh, we're no longer feeling it. Um, we're seeing it because we're looking on the ultrasound screen. So now you're in a tough bind if you're at a center that doesn't do super advanced cardiac arrest care, because we, we now have a situation of a patient whose heart is beating and it's sufficient to generate an echocardiographic or a pocus pulse. But we don't know if it's sufficient to make that fourth link on the chain, which is, is the patient's blood pressure high enough to continue to perfuse the brain and heart sufficiently that they will not degenerate if we leave them here? And you have some tough choices to make. Um, one choice would be take the time to get a manual BP. Not, not crazy about this. 
um, because you're just doing nothing for extended period. And why do I say extended period? Well, if they have a great blood pressure, it's easy. The nurse gets it instantly. If their blood pressure is crappy, they're going to keep inflating the, the arm cuff, deflating, inflating, deflating. I can't hear anything. I don't know. Was it, was it not? Was it, was it not? And it, you could waste a lot of time and the patient could degenerate. Um, what's a really nice way to go is does the patient have a reasonable end title and does the patient have a pulse ox waveform? And these are two indicators that will give you at least a, a uh, somewhat of a, a, a feeling of safety that this patient has a reasonable amount of perfusion. Generating a waveform without compressions is a relatively high bar. It usually means your blood pressure is sufficient to uh, at least temporarily perfuse the brain and heart. A reasonable amount of end tidal CO2 means enough blood is getting back to the lungs to actually be able to exhale end tidal. So th if those two were not there, I would probably say um, you have moments to make a decision of, do you want to empirically give a bolus of vasopressors or do you want to take that manual BP with all the risk we just talked about or do you want to get back on the chest, do some CPR while you get better forms of monitoring like an arterial line? And you're going to have to make those determinations in your individual shop. I'd say at most of the places that your audience uh, works at, Anton, uh, I would say if there's crap end title and no pulse ox waveform, you probably should get back on the chest. If those are good, then take the time to get a manual BP. And just to clarify, what numbers are you looking for exactly on the end title that are going to make you satisfied that there's going to, that there's brain and, and heart perfusion? Yeah, certainly greater than 20, but I might want higher than that um, to make me really feel good. Uh, but but less than 20, I could say pretty definitively that that's not a great perfusion, regardless of what the actual blood pressure turns out to be. Okay, great. I think those are two practical things that most EDs are using end title now. Um, and the oxygen waveform everyone can look at. Uh, so those are good. Those are two good practical ways. We're going to shift gears in the second half of this podcast and talk about approaches to reversible causes of PEA. So we've hacked apart true PEA versus pseudo PEA or press and pulse checks and integrating POCUS and tidal CO2, art lines and O2 saturation waveforms. The next thing you're going to turn your attention to in the resuscitation of the PEA patient are the reversible causes. So let's hear what Samard has to say and then what Weingart has to say. Having an approach to what you're going to do differently with true PEA and pseudo PEA I think is really important. So in true PEA, you're going to follow the ACLS algorithm and understand that this patient probably has less than 1% chance of survival because that's what the ACLS algorithm is going to say for PEA. So you're going to do your... IVs, you're going to get your epinephrine, you're going to think of your reversible causes, and you're going to run the PEA arrest. That is what ACLS is going to tell you to do in true PEA. So here is what I think we should be doing for PEA arrest. I think PEA arrest is one of the most interesting and challenging things in medicine. I think that no two PEAs are, are potentially alike. I think that having a dynamic approach to PEA is probably best. And I think that if your approach to PEA is to follow the ACLS algorithm of, okay, I'm going to give an IV, I'm going to do CPR, I'm going to give epinephrine, I'm going to think of the reversible causes, and that's the only thing you do, you're probably going to have a lot of patients who get pronounced with that. I think that there's a better way. There's got to be. We cannot be satisfied with having less than 5% of people survive. I think that if you have true PEA, you need to immediately divide your PEA into narrow complex and wide complex PEA. I think if you have narrow complex PEA, hypoxia and hypovolemia should be the top things on your list. As you take a history and use your POCUS to determine what the left ventricle is doing, if it's hyperdynamic or if it's hypokinetic. If it's hypokinetic, you're going to be thinking MI. If it's RV is full, you're going to be thinking PE. If your RV collapses, you're going to be thinking of your tamponades and your tension pneumo, although you can easily use ultrasound to help determine those things. If your, P, if your PA is wide, you're thinking of sodium channel blockade, you're thinking of hyperkalemia, you're thinking about giving bicarb, you're thinking about giving calcium in these cases. And then there's also pseudo-PEA, which 
isn't even part of the PEA algorithm. I would argue that if you have pseudo PEA, you should be doing an ultrasound to find out why they're having shock or taking a history as to find out why they're having shock and treat as profound shock. Fluids going, your norepinephrine running, and you're actively, aggressively treating their profound shock state because that's really what it is. So this is a case that we had here. Um, I was called, one of my good colleagues called me over to help out. He had a PA arrest and he says, do you mind just doing an ultrasound to help me out? And when I put the probe over the carotid at the pulse check, I saw that. On the screen, Rob shows an obvious pulsating carotid artery. And I informed the doctor, I think your patient has a pulse. None of us could feel it. There was, I think at this point, three doctors in the room and none of us could feel the pulse. I couldn't feel it underneath my probe either, but I was quite convinced this person had a pulse. So in this case, we said, okay, we can't feel a pulse, but let's just start CPR knowing that we're not going to give any more epinephrines because we don't think this person's in true PEA, but this is going to be temporary while we get everything else going. We're going to start fluids wide open and let's start a norepinephrine infusion, which take, you know, a minute maybe for our nurses to get it hooked up to a pump and running at 10 mics per minute. And we can even go higher if we want, but we started at 10 mics per minute. And on the next pulse check, we still had no pulse. No one could feel a pulse. But when I said, stop CPR totally, let's not restart it. We're not getting anywhere with doing CPR. Let's check a blood pressure. And when we checked a blood pressure, we got one. Also, we had the O2 sat hooked up and we were seeing somewhat of a waveform on the O2 sat monitor. So that's two things pointing to us to perfusion. So we said, we're not doing any more CPR. So the CPR had been held for a minute or two by now. And after about 45 more seconds of the norepinephrine rolling through, we rechecked the blood pressure and the blood pressure was 110 over 60. And at this point, when we saw it on the monitor, we checked for a pulse and everyone could feel a pulse at this stage, a bounding one. So it was very clear this person always had one. We just couldn't feel it. We put an arterial line in and we were getting pressures around 100 over 55 with the norepinephrine rolling. We talked to the ICU. The patient went to the ICU, was transitioned to the ward on day two and DC'd home neurologically intact on day eight. So if we would have just continued to follow the ACLS guideline and continuously gave epinephrine, it's very possible in this case that we would have potentially caused so much profound ischemia from all the epinephrines we gave that we would have had a bad outcome. In this case, we recognized that this was a shock state. In fact, we figured it out that they were actually in septic shock. We started antibiotics shortly afterwards, and the patient ended up having a decent outcome. I just want to insert a little review here on the evidence for epinephrine and cardiac arrest. So the number needed to treat to achieve ROSC prior to hospital arrival is seven. Pretty damn good. But the number needed to harm for worse long-term neurologic outcome is 83. If you recall on the Journal Jam podcast we did on Paramedic 2, that showed, again, improved ROSC plus, for the first time in history, improved 30-day survival, but at the cost, again, of worse long-term neurologic outcomes. So most experts at this time are recommending one or two three at the most doses of epinephrine, and then stop. From an ED perspective, usually EMS has given one or two or three doses in the field already. So in the ED, many experts are now recommending giving zero. So if you have a patient who's in pseudo-PEA, rather than administering one amp of crash cart epi, like we would have assuming that it was true PEA, the way we used to do things, Consider two things. Either you've already hung a norepi drip before the patient's arrived, or you're able to get one going very quickly, or you can use push dose epinephrine guided by blood pressure. And just a reminder the way you do that is you take a 10 milliliter syringe, you put nine milliliters of normal saline, and then you draw up one milliliter of epinephrine from the cardiac amp. Now you have 10 milliliters of epinephrine at 10 micrograms per milliliter, and you can give one or two milliliters every one to five minutes. So that's all I'm going to say about epinephrine for now. Let's hear Weingart's approach to the underlying cause of PEA. Let's talk a little bit about the general approach to PEA in terms of the differential diagnosis. 
Now, in ACLS, it was the H's and the T's, and that's not exactly the most practical way of going through your differential because it doesn't really make sense pragmatically. You just have this huge long list and you can forget stuff easily. Then came along uh, the approach of wide versus narrow, PEA arrest, and I understand that that's been debunked. And again, just to remind our listeners, the wide versus narrow, ischemia can be wide or narrow, but the idea was that if it's wide, then it's some kind of metabolic and or toxicological problem that you're going to be reaching for calcium for hyper-K or you're going to be reaching uh, for bicarb for a TCA overdose, for example. And then the narrow complex is, uh, is more of the anatomical stuff that you can find on POCUS. But I understand that that's been debunked. So that leaves us in this kind of quandary of having to go through the H's and T's. What is your sort of practical approach to going through the differential diagnosis of PEA arrest? Yeah, I don't know about you, Anton. I can't remember those five H's and five T's. I think they're brilliant and they're probably utile in places that don't have the capability of ruling these things out without uh, empiricism or or lists. Um, and if you're going to do that, since no one remembers them, they really should be on a card or a checklist. Like if you're in the EMS environment, having those on a PA card is, I think, the only way to get them done. Because remembering those outside of your ACLS class is really tough. But we just empirically diagnose or treat all of them, and therefore it doesn't really matter as much whether I remember or not. So, you know, we're taking care of hypoxia right up front because we're intubating, we're confirming with entitled CO2, and we're delivering a high FiO2. Um, so that's usually not an issue. They're getting a uh, rush exam during their cardiac arrest, meaning I'm looking at their aorta, I'm looking at their IBC, I'm looking at Morrison's for free fluid in the abdomen. And uh, at during that actual echo during one of, and I should be really clear here, we only do this once every 10 minutes or so, um, we'll actually look for pericardial effusion and and therefore that'll cue us into tamponade. At some point, we'll take a, a look at the chest to make sure we have lung slide on both sides with ventilations. And then we're getting point of care labs and we're getting a point of care arterial or venous blood gas. And, and those get done within you know minutes of the patient arriving. And so that's going to take care of all our metabolic stuff. And then we just have to ask yourself, is this a toxicologic cause that actually caused their cardiac arrest? And, and that, that pretty much takes care of all of them as far as I can remember. All right, Scott, the only step in your four-step approach that we did not talk about is what to do when you don't have a pulse. So we're talking about they have a perfusible rhythm, they do have cardiac activity on echo, but they do not have a pocus pulse. What do you do in that situation? Yeah, and this is where it gets controversial. And, you know, I think, and I don't have proof for this, maybe Rob's group, they did such an amazing service to EM by putting the pocus pulse check in the literature. It's something that I've been using, but no one, there. I actually got confronted on it. Oh, you don't have evidence for it. Now we finally have evidence for, for doing this. I think it detects pulses that you will never be able to feel with your fingers. That's the whole point of it, which means that the bar for a palpable pulse means it implies a higher blood pressure, a much higher blood pressure than a pocus pulse. And so- if you're not able to see a pocus pulse, I think that's an automatic implication that whatever contractions the heart are doing is not sufficient to supply the brain and the heart. I, I think I can make that statement pretty uh, adamantly. And therefore, I think you have no choice but to continue cardiac compressions and, and then work on trying to make those compressions generate a better blood pressure and contraction while those compressions are going on. You know, there was a putative question of, an animal study saying harm from compressions during PA contractions. And uh, that, that literature is scant and poor and I think not applicable. There's been subsequent literature on mechanical CPR actually synchronizing. So you, you could actually link the mechanical devices to various phases of the rhythm you know, which is a much better answer. And yeah, it's better when you synchronize, but it wasn't that bad when you didn't. And since they're not generating a blood pressure, of, of any utility to their heart or brain, I, I don't think you have a choice. Uh, I think you must do compressions if you don't have a pocus pulse, because that's the implication of that is the blood pressure is crap. And then you can try to figure it out for the next pulse check, all the things you're going to do in the interim to try to make those compressions stronger. Maybe that's vasopressors, maybe that's inotropes, maybe that's calcium. Uh, but I don't think you could just try all those things during a period of time where there is cardiac contraction, but no pocus pulse. Let's talk about the situation where you've got a pulse 
And let's say either by the art line or if you don't have an art line by a blood pressure cuff, you've got a pressure of 70 on 40. Now you're rushing around to try and fix the blood pressure and resuscitate the patient. I can tell you that what I personally do is when I get the call in from EMS that I have someone in cardiac arrest, I have the nurses get a norepinephrine drip ready to go and start it as soon as the patient comes in. Is that something that you recommend that we do in all cardiac arrests? How do you manage the pragmatics of getting a presser on board uh, when you do get ROSC? Yeah, I, I can't commend you enough for that kind of logistical thinking, Anton. That That is, not only is it exactly what I do, but I think it's what everyone should do, especially in PA. And if like you're too tentative, oh, I don't know, I don't want to mess up the V-fib, V-tac, you won't. But but I, I, that's fine. You knock yourself out. You, you don't do that on those patients. But on a PA arrest... I think every single one of them should have norepinephrine at 50 micrograms a minute running in the background already set up such that if their only problem is vasodilatory shock, just like the case Rob mentioned, um, and they finally get to a perfusing rhythm that's capable of generating contractions, those contractions will be sufficient to generate a reasonable blood pressure without you having to wait the eight to 10 minutes to get a norepinephrine drip set up. And so I totally agree. Um, I would hook it up to the patient and have it running in the background during all the rest of my arrest. And you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to titrate it. You don't have to touch it. You don't have to think about it. It's just there as this beautiful background presser uh, if the patient does get ROSC. And if that 50 mics after they get ROSC sends their blood pressure a little high, titrate it down, um, go immediately to our normal dose range of from 50 to 20, and it will be off in you know, a few seconds that med is going to be titratable down to a much better place. But uh, you know, your epi is what's going to make them profoundly hypertensive, not that 50 micrograms of norepi. It's like orders of magnitude less than the epi you're already giving this patient. And Let's say you didn't listen to us, Anton. You didn't have that drip set up and running. Um, what do you do? Well, I think giving them a milligram of epi sounds like a horrible idea. And Rob alluded to that. I think that could make things worse. Uh, but you got to give them something. You don't want to leave them at a map of 50 for too long. And you don't want to wait the eight minutes to nor epi. So you got a couple choices. One thing you could do is give them push dose epinephrine. And so I would give them 10 or 20 micrograms and see if that's sufficient um, as opposed to a milligram. The other thing is my friend Gregor Posen, uh, Gregor Posen rather, uh, from Slovenia published an article, and and it's really great. They they if they saw echocardiographic contractions insufficient to generate a reasonable blood pressure to make a palpable pulse happen, what they would do is push twenty international units of vasopressin, and and this was a case series, it wasn't an RCT. I think that's a very clever move if you still have vasopressin available because um, that will give you a nice background of vasopressor to give you time to get something like a norepi and may actually cause a pulse that is palpable and therefore a blood pressure that is sufficient to perfuse the heart and the brain. That's great, Scott. So there's three options then. Number one, if you have time before the patient arrives, get your norepinephrine drip ready so that you can start it as soon as the patient does arrive. Number two, you can have a push dose presser like epinephrine drawn up and ready to give, you know, 10 to 20 micrograms at a time every one to five minutes. Uh, and the third option is give vasopressin 20 international units IV push just as a bridge to until you get your norepinephrine drip going. So one thing we didn't explain at the outset explicitly was we're talking about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and PEA. When it comes to in-hospital cardiac arrest and PEA or in the emergency department cardiac arrest and PEA, I'm going to let Dr. Weingart talk about how that's a little bit different situation. If you have a patient that codes in front of you with PEA, I guess the, the parting message for everyone involved is if you have a patient in the ED who was talking to you and all of a sudden they're in PA, none of that stuff about the dismal survivability of this rhythm has any applicability to that patient. All of the survivors um, that I've seen for thrombolysis during cardiac arrest have been PA patients. Uh, I've had a couple V-fibs, but most of them have been PE patients who die in front of me to PA. And if you lice those patients immediately, their outcomes are amazingly good. There was a uh, subset of one of the big thrombolysis trials that looked specifically of patients diagnosed with PE who code in front of them to PA, giving immediate lysis, and their survival rate was amazing. So don't lump the people who have uh, witnessed the rest in the ED with PA to the ones who have out-of-hospital PA. 
Dr. Weingart, what do you think about the future of PEA or arrest management? Do you think there's anything kind of coming down the pike that's going to really change what we do? <laughs> well, there, there's ECMO. Um, and, you know, traditionally, we've only done VFIB, VTAC for ECMO. And I know most of your audience is immediately falling asleep now because they're like, this has no applicability to me. But that doesn't necessarily hold true. You know, ECMO retrieval, pre-hospital ECMO, this stuff's all happening. And the machines get easier. The techniques get easier. True. There are new ECMO centers popping up from coast to coast, even in Canada. So ECMO may be coming to a community hospital near you soon. Another wave that seems to have gained some momentum is intra-arrest TEE, transesophageal echo. So keep your eye open for that as well. We're actually going to be doing an upcoming EM cases quick hit on that topic. All right, let's take it all home now with a review to put all of this PEA stuff together. Here we go. Just because you can't feel a pulse does not mean the patient is pulseless. You can distinguish between pseudo-PEA and true PEA with POCUS, with an art line, with oxygen saturation waveform, and with end tidal CO2. And that distinction will change your management from true cardiac arrest management to profound shock management. Now, it's important to know that POCUS can lead us to delays in chest compressions and prolonged pulse checks, so make sure that you have the logistics down so that you're spending no longer than 5 to 10 seconds without chest compressions in true PEA. All right, let's run through what you do and what your options are when you get that call from EMS that they have a PEA patient coming in. I encourage you to review the full suggested PE algorithm in the show notes a couple of times. Okay, so before the patient arrives, get a norepinephrine drip hung. Have it ready to start when the patient arrives, if you have the person power, so that as soon as you can identify a true pulse and blood pressure, you have the norepinephrine ready to titrate up or down. If you don't have time for that and you do need a presser quickly, Remember that there is an option of vasopressin 20 international units or push dose epinephrine. Now, when the patient arrives, ask yourself four questions. And this is Weingart's approach, which I think is great. So number one, do they have a perfusible rhythm? Number two, do they have cardiac contractility? Number three, do they have a pulse from that contractility? And number four, do they have a sufficient blood pressure to perfuse vital organs? So how do you distinguish true PEA from pseudo PEA using all of these tools? Well, we talked about the O2 SAT waveform and tidal CO2. Remember that that's actually in the guidelines as a must have. Now with POCUS, you can either start on the heart during that first pause in chest compression or on the femoral. If you determine that it's pseudo-PEA, or if the patient has already received more than three doses of epinephrine in the field, don't give amps of crash cart epi. Give volume and titratable pressors, norepinephrine or, again, push-dose epinephrine. If you determine that it is true PEA, use the EMS history, POCUS, lights off the blood gas to help you with the differential diagnosis. While the wide versus narrow QRX complex approach has been debunked, I think it is still useful, even if it's just to help remind you of all those causes. Whichever way, as you go through your resuscitation, you'll be addressing hypoxemia and hypovolemia when you're managing the airway and when you're giving fluids. And with your POCUS, you'll be addressing tamponade, tension pneumo if you see a collapsed RV uh, or on your, on your lung POCUS. A uh, massive PE if you see a huge RV, a massive MI if you see obvious poor LV function on your cardiac POCUS, and you'll also be using POCUS in the belly for looking at volume status, free fluid, ruptured AAA. And then with your lights off the blood gas, you're particularly looking for hyper K, and of course, don't forget tox, especially sodium channel blockers like cocaine and TCAs. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Weingart and Dr. Samard. Since much of what we talked about in this podcast is in the evidence-free realm, please do email me your opinions or place your comments at the bottom of the show notes for this episode. And until next time, think carefully about how you want to go beyond ACLS and tailor your approach to PEA to your specific skills and working environment. Take it easy. Take it easy.